C'est l'heure à la queue. Welcome. Uh, today will be honored by the presence and lecture of our uh, distinguished scholar, philosopher, thinker, activist, leader, uh, Dr. Uh, Arif Nayed. He's going to uh, talk to us about Arab Springs. He doesn't like to use the uh, term Arab Spring. He likes to use Arab Springs in the plural form. And I'm sure he'll explain the reasons why he prefers Arab Springs over Arab Spring. Uh, he will uh, he will uh, talk about this subject not as an external observer because he is part of the uh, process. He has been uh, an important player uh, in the process. Uh, and, uh, I'm sure he will apply his philosophical mind into this uh, political uh, process. Uh, as you all know, uh, political scientists and experts of international relations failed to predict something like this and now they fail to understand and analyze it because uh, the tools, the conceptual tools, the methods, the theories, the paradigms they are uh, using uh, in understanding what's going on in the uh, Muslim world, in the Arab world, uh, they are useless uh, tools. Uh, so this uh, phenomenon made it uh, explicit that we cannot analyze Muslim societies uh, using the tools of modern political science and international uh, relations uh, discipline. We need a new approach, new paradigm, new tools, conceptual tools, methodological tools to analyze uh, Muslim world. And the failure of uh, of uh, so many social scientists in the world and they are uh, revered, uh, respected as great uh, scholars, experts uh, in their field in something uh, in, in such large scale uh, this, uh, this, is, this uh, testifies that we can no longer use these uh, tools in understanding ourselves we have to understand ourselves by the conceptual tools, methodological tools, we produce for ourselves. Otherwise, we will remain intellectually, academically dependent on the Western uh, social uh, sciences. Uh, and uh, this dependency is not going to help us understand uh, ourselves. It's very uh, ironic and paradoxical that we are using the concepts uh, methods, theories, Western social scientists produced to understand uh, ourselves. Uh, we have to overcome this intellectual uh, dependency and uh, inshallah uh, tonight's talk by uh, Dr. Arif uh, will be a step uh, towards this. He will open a window for us to uh, better understand what's going on uh, in the uh, Arab world. Uh, thank you very much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, thank you very much for uh, coming. Despite the short notice, this uh, occasion uh, was uh, put together very uh, rapidly by my uh, dear uh, brother, friend, and uh, teacher, uh, Professor uh, uh, Rajan. And I'm really grateful for the hospitality and for this uh, kindly arranging of this so quickly. And thank all of you who are, uh, I'm sure, very busy with many uh, worthy projects and are taking the time to listen to this poor man from uh, uh, Africa about the Arab Springs. So thank you for coming. And uh, <clears throat> let me just uh, tell you how I come to you uh, and, and under what conditions, because this is very important uh, as background and also very important in understanding what, what kind of 
tools we are trying to elaborate or to retrieve or to articulate, as Professor Rajab Shantur was saying. Uh, I come to you after uh, after uh, what, nine or ten months of, of revolution, basically. A uh, very tired man, and uh, had uh, very little time to reflect or, or, uh, or read or write. Or, uh, we have been incredibly busy, uh, revolting against Gaddafi's tyranny, and uh, basically opening a new future for our country. And it, it has been a, a most uh, hectic and, and uh, tiresome uh, experience. At times uh, very joyful, and at times uh, tragic and, and very sad. And uh, the cost has been monumental in terms of human lives. Uh, we have many, uh, actually tens of thousands of, of uh, martyrs and uh, injured and handicapped and missing persons. And it's so uh, it's, it's been a rather painful and, and very uh, hectic pace. Uh, I come to you after. Uh, travels back and forth between uh, the UAE and, and various parts of Libya and Qatar and, and uh, Istanbul and various other countries and a uh, mixture of diplomatic work and, and uh, political work and some military work and some so it's been rather hectic and this is very much the very first academic setting I come to after all this commotion so I am utterly exhausted and utterly confused so if you find confusion in what I have to say do please forgive me for it and, and also try to understand that I am coming to you in order to get some help from you in trying to sort things out because what has been happening in my country, Libya, and in many other uh, Arab countries has been nothing uh, short of, of uh, uh, amazing, amazingly complex uh, and amazingly uh, difficult and amazingly wonderful all, all at the same time and uh, trying to sort it out, trying to figure it out, trying to articulate a way of reflecting upon it. As Aristotle says, you know, the philosophic life is a life of reflection, and a life not reflected upon is not worth living, as they say. So it is part of the duty of, of a Muslim to, to exercise another, as uh, Imam Baqillani and, uh, and Imam Maturidi and the great, great uh, scholars of Kalam would say that another is wajib, you know, for, for uh, humanity. So we need to reflect upon what's happening in our lives, and we need to reflect uh, as deeply as we can, and also reflect jointly and collectively, because uh, the notion of a solitary figure just thinking, what, uh, what Ibn Bajah called tadbir al-mutawahid, to think by yourself, is actually uh, helpful in some contexts, but uh, needs a lot of social uh, interaction and a lot of networking and a lot of uh, joint thinking. Uh, as Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Al mu'min mir'at al mu'min," and we are mirrors for each other. So we, we need to. I can only see myself through discussing with you. So I'm hoping that after uh, the talk, that we can maybe ex exchange some views and maybe if you can help me with some reflections and advice, so that we can go forward, inshallah. This is, uh, this is the uh, uh, first note I wanted to, to say. As uh, Professor Rajab was saying, uh, I don't like the term uh, Arab Spring as if it's one singular phenomena, phenomenon. I like to... Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Uh, you, you're having difficulties? Should I speak yes. a bit? I would prefer it louder. I will, I will try to speak a little bit louder, okay? Is this okay? All right, okay. Um, I was telling you I'm a tired man, so... <laughs> but uh, I prefer the plural Arab Springs to singular Arab Spring because I believe that we are dealing with a multiplex phenomenon, uh, as uh, Professor Rajab would like to call it, multiplex, multiplexity, huh, he would say. It's a tongue twister, but it's a very important concept. Uh, there is no single Arab Spring. As a matter of fact, I believe that it's a huge mistake to uh, simply think that you understand what's happening in Libya just because you, you understand what's happening in Yemen or in Egypt or in Tunis or in Syria. I think every country has its own unique dynamic. As a matter of fact, I think within the Arab, Arab Spring in a particular country, there are lots of springs within that country. 
I believe in, the, in Libya itself, the Arab Spring in Libya is actually a complex set of springs. And they are happening, as uh, Professor Rajab would say, at different uh, layers of wujud, the maratik wujud. They are happening at different uh, strata of existence, different layers of existence. They are also happening in different regions, different networks, different backgrounds. And lots of factors are mixed together in a, in a, a most complex, intricate texture. And I think it's very important to point that out from the start. You know, if we look at Alama Ibn Khaldun, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, and they're very proud to be a fellow North African, uh, he's one of our great uh, uh, thinkers. And uh, Alama Ibn Khaldun, when he developed his notions of Asabiya, for example, or of Umran al Bashari, or of, for example, the dialectic between Asabiya and Dawa, uh, makes it very clear that these take unique and many ways complex forms and shapes depending on the situation. As a matter of fact, if you look carefully at the Muqaddima, you will find that there isn't a single kind of asabiyyah, but types of asabiyyat, and that there isn't a single type of da'wah, but different types of da'wah. In Libya, and I, I often find the tools of Ibn Khaldun rahmatullahi quite useful for understanding uh, matters in Libya, because we do have asabiyyah and we do have da'wah all mixed up. We also have the dialectic between the Medina and the Bedou, and the, and the, or the Bedou elements and the, and the Madani elements. And uh, lots of the complexities of the Libyan situation have to do with uh, the mixing together of these factors, sometimes in the very same person. So that you find that in the same person, he's a, he's a tribesman because he comes from a certain tribe, but he is also a city dweller because he's lived all his life in the city. And he is, has a da'wah because he belongs to the Ikhwan or to the Salafiyya or to the Sufiyya or one of the, the various types of Islamic da'wah. And he's also a, 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 a bit of a Bedouin because of the family tradition, but also a city dweller because of the education. He is a merchant because his father was a merchant and he's an engineer in the Guild of Engineers. So in the same one single person, you will find this multiplexi multiplexity that the professor speaks of, and this multi-layered uh, thing, and the bundling together of networks. So you can say that the person is a node, but he is a node in a multiplicity of networks all at once. So he's connected with various, in various ways to various networks all at once. So it is very difficult to generalize about these Arab Springs. As a matter of fact, the Libyan Spring itself is very complicated. As a matter of fact, within every Libyan, there is a complexity of things happening all at once. Maybe what I am trying to do in coming to Istanbul to reflect and to think and to consult with, with the dear friends and, and colleagues is to try to sort out some of these strands in this complexity. Because I believe it may sound strange for a Libyan to come to Istanbul to sort things out in understanding his Libyanness. But I, I believe that it's not strange at all if you consider that until very recently it was called Tarablus Garb, Iyalet Tarablus Garb, and that I, I actually am, I chose the Conrad Hotel to stay in in Istanbul because it's only meters away from the Teke of uh, Muhammad Zafir al Madani, Sheikh Zafir, one of the Shaykh of Sultan Abdul Hamid, and uh, uh, who, who used to host Libyans and Tunisians and Algerians. Uh, when they came to the court in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the late 19th century uh, to, to discuss matters of, of the Ummah at large. So th there is a, a, a dimension of Libyanness that's actually quite intimately connected with, with Istanbul and, and with its history and with what was happening during the period of Islahat in late Ottoman period and in the early uh, years of the 20th century. World War I was a great catastrophe for everyone, but even as it was happening and just before it was happening, there were great thinkers who were trying to deal with the very same issues that we are trying to deal with today. Like Muhammad Daf al-Madani, like Abu al-Huda al-Sayyadi, who unfortunately always gets bad press in the, some of the history books. They give him, make him a very dark character. But the man has a small book on Rahim al-Insani, on, on common humanity, which is as sophisticated or more sophisticated than Erasmus on a kind of humanistic ethics. And, and yet these things unfortunately get neglected uh, except by you know, specialized scholars. So 
in a way, I, I, it's natural for me to come to Istanbul to try and sort out some of my identity and some of my issues, just as it is very important for me to have discussions with the Sanusi family and Sanusi scholars who have another dimension of Libyanness and who are related to a certain dimension of Libyanness that has been almost forgotten, but not gone. I mean, it's not a coincidence that Libyans in this glorious revolution rallied around three fundamental symbols. The flag, which was the Sanusi flag, okay. and, and the, you know, the crescent and the star and so on, of course, has Ottoman connections as well. And the uh, uh, Omar Mukhtar, rahmatullahi alayhi, a great scholar who was also a Sanusi Sufi sheikh and the leader of a, of a zawiya, of a lodge, of a tekke, you know. And uh, the third is the national anthem, um, who is not, which is not written by Libyan or, nor composed by Libyan, but which came to connect people with the, with the old Libya, the, the Libya of independence, the, the fresh Libya before it got violated and, and before it got corrupted by, by the Gaddafi uh, tyranny of 42 years. So these three symbols are, are very important, and it's very important in trying to understand what is happening to us to link up with these multiple dimensions of our soul, the Sanusi dimension, the Ottoman dimension, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Bedouin dimension, the tribes, and, and, their, and their refusal of, of being to, to, to be ruled by anyone, you know, this un, un, unruly kind of independence that is in the, in the Libyan tribal character. Uh, also, the, the, the history, the struggle for independence, and the young parties that came about and disappeared in the 1940s and 50s and, and early 60s, uh, people, uh, parties like the uh, Muqtamar party and the Jamiyat Omar Muhtar party, and, and various other parties, clubs like the al Nadi Al-Adabi, which was in Tripoli, which was a, a congregation of poets and, and uh, literature uh, uh, experts and, and authors who were discussing uh, national affairs. Many young Libyans have lived their entire life during Gaddafi's period. They don't know this past, except through some family secrets and some family stories that were told, but always with great caution. I remember being told many things, but also told not to talk about them at school, you know? Because if you talked about them at school, it would have been a disaster. I remember my father teaching me the anthem, but also telling me never to sing it. Because at school, if you sang that anthem, you, you would be in big trouble, you know? So what I'm trying to say is our identities as Libyans are, are multiplex, are, are very complicated. There are many strands. And some strands, interestingly enough, are linked with Istanbul. And so I don't find it to be strange to, to be here. And maybe I, I do not find it at all strange to be in this particular institute with the particular uh, scholars who are here, because I think we share a lot of the, of the longing for identity, what I call rootedness in the title of this talk, when we talk about freedom and rootedness. Now this rootedness is very important, and rootedness is all about networking. If you look at the way the roots of a tree are, are formed, they are, yes, very much issuing from one uh, radical or root, and they are ex extending outwards, but they are also part of intricate networks with other roots, of other trees, and even with bacteria and many other creatures lurking in the earth, meaning rootedness is already about networking. And it's very important as you search for your roots, as you try to be authentic to yourself, to who you are, to link up with other human beings who are also trying to network and to find themselves. So maybe just as two people hit by different cars, <laughs> sitting, lying in the hospital beds next to each other, trying to remind each other of who they are, you know? Oh, so your name is Ahmad, ah yes, where did you live? And they're, they're trying to have a conversation to overcome amnesia. Because amnesia is exactly what we suffer from. It's amazing that a young Libyan today grows up without knowing anything about the Sanusis, without knowing anything about the great scholars, the great muftis, the great ulema of his country or her country, the great women scholars who 
were trying to establish a great Libya like Khadija Jahmi and many other women in, in the early independence movement in Libya. We are trying to find out who we are. And as we are trying to find out who we are, we, it's very important to commune with and have discussions with and dialogue with people who are also trying to find themselves. Turkey is a great nation, no doubt. And uh, I mean, just looking at Istanbul, just walking in Istanbul, you can, you can see the greatness, you can smell the greatness. It's almost overwhelming, the greatness. But it's also a country trying to find out who it is exactly. Is it European? Is it Asian? Is it Islamic? Is it secular? Is it... And even when we say secular, what kind of secularism? Is it a secularism that's necessarily anti-religious? Or is there a form of secularism that's more mature, that is more open, that is more accommodating of the rootedness of the Turkish people? Are the Turkish people only Turkish? Or are they Ottoman? Are they, are they, are they cosmopolitan in character? Is, are there different strands? What, what constitutes being Turkish? I am sure that many scholars in this country are trying to find out, and there are great books. I, I always regret not having learned the language, inshallah, I will try. I'm sure there is vast literature out there that can help. As we Libyans and, and Arabs try to, to uh, and not all Libyans are, are Arabs, by the way, there are also our brothers, the Amazigh, and the Tabu, and the, and the, and the Tuareg, you know, are not ethnically Arab. And in this new Libya that goes beyond Arab nationalism, we are trying to find out a sense of Libyanness that is, that is more inclusive, that's, that's a lot more complex, that does not flatten our character into one nationalism or into one ideology or into one uh, way of looking at the world, that we cherish the, the rich tapestry and the texture of our country. So we're trying to find out who we are. So when we talk about rootedness, I do not mean rootedness in one's and only in one's own tradition and only in one way. But I mean rootedness in a complex way, in a way that links up with other people trying to find out their roots, including Europeans. Europeans are also trying to find out their roots. Americans are trying to find out their roots. Why is it important to be rooted? It's the same reason that a seed does not grow on the concrete, although I am always struck by the image of a small uh, you know, green shoot coming out of the concrete. But if you look very carefully, you'll find that it's a crack in the concrete or a pocket where some soil settled. You cannot grow without having roots. The, as, as the imagery of the good tree in the Quran, the Kalima Tayyibah, Aslaha Thabit, it has rootedness, it has a constant root or radical, Wafaruha Fissana, and its branches are in the heavens or in the, on the, or in the sky. It is with these two condition, conditions, being rooted, but also being open, that you get the third. Uh, okay? You get the fruitfulness. So you get the fruitfulness from a combination of rootedness and openness. And you get this fruit, fr fruitfulness not through your own deeds and through your egoistic imposition of will, but بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا with the permission of your Lord or, or its Lord because without this إِذْنِ Rabbani, you cannot have anything this is why it is extremely important when I reflect upon the Libyan spring or springs to realize that it's actually a gift from Allah Azza wa from God because really it's nothing short of a karama or of a miracle uh, you, you know, uh, in English we say miracle, in Arabic you have to distinguish between karama and mu'ajiza. Mu'ajiza is only for prophets, karama is for everybody else. Okay? And, but karama to awliya, mu'ajiza to anbiya. The karama is actually derivative of the miraculousness of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there is a beautiful uh, phrase that I was reading recently in the Mathnawi al-Arabi nuri of Badi'ul Zaman al-Nursi rahmatullahi alayhi, in which he describes the spring. And I think it's a very good description of the Libyan spring. And he describes the spring as exhibiting the stamp of God, of Allah Azza And he expresses it like this. I will read it in, uh, in English. I translated it this morning. He says, yes, in this great management of spring, at tasarruf al azim al rabii he says. Okay. Yes, in this great management of spring, 
there is a great sublime and intricate stamp of the Lordship Rububiyya of God. This stamp consists of, and then he has a string of descriptions, ultimate perfection, in ultimate regularity, in ultimate generosity, in ultimate broadness, in ultimate speed, in ultimate excellence, in ultimate intricacy. This stamp is unique to the one who is not prevented by one act from exercising another act. The one from whom nothing is hidden and for whom nothing is difficult. You know, one year ago, if I were to describe the atmosphere in Tripoli, when we had coffee in cafes and so on, it was despair. Everyone was so depressed. And everybody despaired of any change. They had waited for over seven years for Sefer Islam to make his famous reforms. And these reforms were resulting in a great highway robbery of the whole country. He was basically stealing the money with his uh, colleagues from various companies that were handpicked to steal with him. But there was nothing happening in the country. Seven years the people waited for the reforms. Nothing happened. And there was just despair. And I remember, you know, the way I used to heal my heart of despair. And I used to advise my students in the uh, Ottoman Madrasa in Old Tripoli, which is called Uthman Pasha Madrasa. I used to tell them, you must remember the words of Ahmad Zarruq. Ahmad Zarruq is a great Shadili Shaykh. And he used to say, whenever you despair, remember, the verse from the Quran, in yasha' yudhibkum wa'ati bi khalqin jadeed wa ma dhalika ala Allah bi aziz. If he wishes, he will obliterate you and bring a new creation. And this is not difficult for, for Allah. And it's very important to remember that with God's creativity, there can be no despair. He is the ultimate creator and he can make things happen. You know, just as people felt that there was no way of overcoming this regime, you know? Something happened. Something almost, like, just mind-boggling happened. Young people with nothing in their hands walked to massive camps full of arms, full of mercenaries, and with their bare hands, and as they were shot at with, with anti-aircraft machine guns, still marched forward to wrench their freedom away from this tyrant. This is, this is not something normal. This, is, this has the stamp, the taghurra, as, as Mursi would say, of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is very much a miraculous act. And it is extremely important as we speak about the Arab Spring, or Arab Springs, or Libyan Springs, not to think that we made it. And unfortunately, we're already say, seeing some and hearing some voices within Libya of people claiming, on television even, that I made this, I did this, I started the revolution. I am the one who liberated Tripoli. I am the one. And unfortunately, some television channels funded by certain countries, you know, they make certain people seem like the great heroes and forget about other people and so on. This is nonsense. It is nobody's revolution. And it is everybody's revolution because it is Allah's revolution. And it is because it is a dispersed revolution. It is nothing like central command or control. There was no central command or control in this revolution, not even from the National Council, because even the way the National Transitional Council emerged was a phenomenon of complexity and emergence. It was not a single player determining with design that this should be the case or should this other thing should be the case. It, the whole thing just emerged, and it emerged in a very complex and convoluted manner in a way that is just mind-boggling. If you try to make sense of it, it's very difficult. That is why I need your help in making sense of this, because the tools for, as, as uh, Professor Rajab was saying, of social sciences, the tools of, of how revolutions happen or the theories of how revolutions happen just don't seem to, to fit. I can think of certain um, notions or ideas that may be helpful, and I've already used some of them in this talk so far, but maybe we can just go through some of them. Uh, uh, multiplexi multiplexity, uh, which I could never uh, pronounce properly, is one, one idea, and it's a very, very useful tool. That is why I believe the work of Professor Rajab should be translated into, into English, the, the new book on, uh, on open uh, science, uh, and, and it's extremely important to, to put that forth. 
but also notions like multi-layered architecture in software engineering, where you, uh, as you write the software, you make certain tools or a, you make a toolkit at different layers of of uh, of, of, uh, of of work in a way, and then you pull them together um, with with various algorithms. Maybe we can use some of the language from IT, like uh, multi-layered uh, architecture. Also, the uh, literature from networking theory, uh, not just uh, social networking theory, but also IT networking theory, uh, because it's very important. For example, I noticed in Libya and the revolution that there, were, that there were certain routers who were important not because of what they said or did, but because of what they trafficked through. This is very important. It's, a, it's, a, it's as if, for example, our, even our leader, Sheikh Mustafa Abdel Jalil, he wasn't giving commands in a sense, but in a way trafficking or, or helping to route uh, traffic more than, than actually commanding. And people find it puzzling, the style of leadership that there is, because I think theories of leadership do not apply to this revolution classical theories of leadership. So maybe the notion of a leader as a router of sorts in a network is, a, is an interesting notion to, to work with. Uh, also, you know, uh, as you know, there is a, now in sociology, social networks and social networking theory, and uh, I'm sure that there are, it would be great to do a mapping of various nodes of the Libyan Spring and other Arab Springs. I think this is the kind of tool you would need more than uh, just classical sociology uh, uh, methods. Also, even things like the Austrian School of Economics with alternative models, uh, like in Hayek, for example, of, of talking about uh, dispersed knowledge and tacit knowledge so that there is no single economic player that knows beforehand or designs the economy beforehand or determines the price beforehand, but the price being an emergent property from various imperfect dispersed nuggets of knowledge, of tacit knowledge in the economy. Maybe such a political economic idea of dispersed knowledge can also be used in trying to understand these Arab Springs because in many ways nobody had the master plan for the revolution. Everybody had an imperfect bit of knowledge and, and often tacit. We, 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 we didn't even talk about it often. And, and maybe what I'm trying to do here is to begin to articulate some parts of this tacit, partial, dispersed knowledge that, is, that, that contributed in, in a little way to this revolution, just as there was an abundance of other contributions. Uh, again, maybe we should retrieve some of the notions from Ibn Khaldun, rahmatullahi alayhi, especially this notion of tabai' al umran And maybe these tabai' uh, are, are more complex than just one tabi'ah. It's very interesting that he calls it tabai' al-umran. And maybe this has to do with Aristotle's notion that there isn't one causality, that there is a, 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 a multiplex causality, that there are different types of causes, the effective cause, the material cause, the teleological cause, the formal cause. And, and, and in, in a way, you can sense this typology even in Ibn Khaldun rahmatullahi alayhi. His tabai' were actually multiplex. And as uh, uh, one sister was saying uh, yesterday regarding the mawaqif of Shatibi, that many people flatten Shatibi, and I think she's right about that. They flatten Shatibi because they make the maqasid into a set of principles or rules, or maybe just points, while the maqasid in Shatibi are much, much more complicated. They, they are actually happening at the multiplicity of levels within the person himself, within the niya of the person, and within society itself. You know, if you look at Ibn al-Hajj, rahmatullahi alayhi, in, in his book, Al-Madkhal, he talks about the layers of niya. So there's a multi multiplexity within the intentionality of the single human being. So when we talk about maqasid al-shari'ah, it's a lot more complicated just, than just a set of four or five or six uh, general principles. So Ibn Khaldun rahmatullahi alayhi had this kind of, of refinement, this kind of intricacy. Maybe we need to look at Ibn Khaldun, 
but this time not just in a historicist way as Rosenthal and others have looked at him, but in a way that mixes him up with the Santa Fe Institute's research on complexity and on emergence and on artificial life and on complex systems analysis, social networking theory, neural nets even. Maybe what we can do is to look at these complex figures like Ibn Khaldun, like the, the late Ottoman uh, uh, writers, like uh, Sayyadi, Muhammad, uh, uh, Hussein al-Jisr, uh, even recent ones like Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari, even Mustafa Sabri, rahmatullahi alayhi. These great, great reformers who get neglected simply because they were too faithful to the tradition. I'm always amazed that everybody knows about Muhammad Abdu and Jamal Din Afghani, rahmatullahi alayhi ma. And, and they don't know about Mustafa Sabri, Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari, and the alternative school. So if they look at the Tunisian reformers, they look at the reformers who were against the tradition. But they don't look at Ibn Ashur and his Tahrir and Tanweer. They do not look at Khairuddin al Tunisi and his, and his uh, 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 open-mindedness, but rootedness. We, we need to retrieve these figures, and we need to make sure that as we retrieve them, we are also utilizing some of the uh, ideas that may not necessarily come from the social sciences. They may come from economics. They may come, they may come from mathematical theory. They may come from IT, the uh, information technology. They may come from uh, things as weird as, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, multimedia, you know? And uh, the graphic design that is now using computers to generate uh, uh, motion out of small uh, you know, very uh, small nuggets of programming. So you can get a small set of rules that can actually generate a very complex tree, you know. This kind of artificial life approach, our mashayikh knew this. You know, when Ibn Atallah secondary says in the, in the Hikam al-Ata'iyya, man ashraqat bidayatuhu, ashraqat nihayatuhu. If the beginnings are luminescent, the ends are luminescent, he's basically saying that your life is a chaotic system that is uh, very sensitive to initial conditions, as they say in physics. So you must make your initial conditions luminescent. Uh, they may be a set, very small set of initial conditions, but they make a whole world of difference. Take, for example, the principle that there is an akhira, that there is an eschatological dimension to life. This just this one principle changes your calculation. So if you are doing cost-benefit analysis, okay, in, with dunya we sense only, so only in this life, your results will be utilitarian. In the classical sense of utilitarianism, like Bentham and, and uh, John Stuart Mill and, and these people. But if you open the horizon of expectation, what Ernst Bloch the uh, great Marxist thinker calls the not yet. If you bring in the not yet into the calculation, you will find that your cost-benefit analysis changes completely. Just as in mathematics with the notion of infinity. If you take a very large number, like a trillion, it looks very large. But if you divide it by infinity, the result is zero. Even if it's 10 trillion, you divide it by infinity, again, zero. And if you take any number, okay, if you take any number, and you take infinity and divide it by any number, no matter how large it is, and you'll always get infinity. So that means infinity changes everything. So the akhirah, as an infinite dimension beyond this life, if you bring it into your utilitarian calculation, will change all your formula. It will, it will, you will get a very different economics. John Stuart Mill in his political economy, as he speaks of utility functions and, and cost-benefit analysis, did not have this eschatological calculation. But maybe somebody like uh, Asfahani with his book on Nash'atayn, on the two creations, or Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, be it in the Mishkat or the, the Hiya or the, or the Munkath, talks of this Sa'ada Ukhrawiyya, this, this happiness in the hereafter. So that as we seek happiness, it's not just 
a, a limited to this life, your calculations get altered. So what I'm trying to say is, let us take many of these amazing ideas which are now merging at the Santa Fe Institute, at MIT, you know, with, with very advanced mathematical theory, theories of complexity, and let us look at our shiuch, and look at this multi, multi, <laughs> multiplexity I mean, that, you, you, that you say, and, 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 and look at the maratib al wujud in this way. Look at even things like al haraka al in Mullah Sadra, for example, as an inner dynamism that, 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 that is now talked about. In, the, in quantum mechanics, for example. Let us look at Bakillani and Juwaini with their Jawahir and A'rad and talk about A'rad as a kind of emergence phenomenon uh, or phenomenon rather than just uh, think of it, thinking of it as a mere tag. In this way, Kalam can be renewed. A new Kalam can emerge. And when we say Kalam, we don't mean a set of just beliefs or doctrines. We mean a new articulation of who we are of what, what, what the purpose of our life is, the meaning of our life is, we need new articulations. So what I'm trying to say is, maybe for the Libyan Spring and the Arab Springs, none of the tools that are now in the, in the, on the shelf can simply be applied. But maybe we need to come up with a new set of tools and new set of ways that are a mixture between classical sources in our own tradition and avant-garde, very advanced, cutting-edge mathematical and, and information technology concepts, economic concepts, and maybe, maybe have the humility to recognize that we are not the first generation to be facing this difficulty of a new articulation. The challenge of a new kalam was already spoken of in the late 19th century, as it was spoken of in the late 19th, 18th century, as it was spoken of in the late 16th century. As a matter of fact, there are no dark ages, as they teach us about in the, in the history of Islam. As a matter of fact, every generation of Muslims has been trying, like every generation of Jews, and like every generation of Christians, and every generation of Buddhists, you know, the Japanese, Kyoto School, you know, Hajime Nishitani, uh, Kitaro, for example, they, they were trying, they were going to Germany to study with Martin Heidegger to figure out how they can reconcile uh, uh, pure land Buddhism with existentialism. Just as Muslims today are struggling, well, how do I make sense of hermeneutics or semiotics or postmodern Iridian thought? Because every generation is a living generation that has a challenge of combining two things that we talked about in the, in the title, and that is freedom and rootedness. The freedom to seek new horizons, to seek new ways, to try to be free, to try to be open, to try to, to do things never done before, to see things in ways that were never seen before, but at the same time, be rooted in your tradition. And there is no contradiction. If somebody says, Look at the door, it opens and closes. Sorry? But there is a problem with the door. It's fixed on one side of it. On the side of the, what do you call it, the hinges. It is fixed. So somebody might say, I don't like this door. It doesn't have enough freedom. It is too fixed at the hinges. Let me remove the hinges. You can remove the hinges, but you will have no more door, meaning, Openness, openness is a result of some fixity. You cannot have total openness. Just as with the notion of degrees of freedom, you know when industrial engineers design robotic arms, they have this concept which they call degrees of freedom. So a robotic arm that moves like this has single point of freedom. One that moves like this and like this has two. One that moves like this, like this, and like this has three. This has four, you know, and some genius will say, that means the perfect robotic arm, you know, logically, should have infinite degrees of freedom. And that's wrong, because a robotic arm that has infinite degrees of freedom is no arm at all. I mean, you cannot do anything with it. So you do need some fixity in life. But it's a weird kind of fixity that you need. It is a fixity 
that allows for freedom. A fixity that becomes a principle for rotation. What Imam Nawawi calls in his book Riyad al-Salihin and in his book on Adhkar, he calls al-ahadith allati yadur alayha madar al-Islam. So there are ahadiths that are pivots around which Islam rotates. For example, the famous hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَادِ وَلِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَنَاوَى That deeds are constituted by intentions. And to every human or person, that which they intend. This is a pivotal hadith. What the Shaykh is trying to say, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, is that there are certain ahadith, certain principles, what the Mashaykh call مَا عُلِمَ مِنَ الدِّينِ بِالْضَرُورَةِ That which we necessarily know of religion, that actually does not limit your freedom, but actually is the condition of possibility of your freedom. That is what Immanuel Kant calls conditions of possibility, which is extremely important. So when Immanuel Kant talks about freedom as a postulate for human activity, for human action, what he is saying is that for you to be able to be free to act, okay, we, you must postulate this freedom. But at the same time, he himself recognized that this freedom can only be postulated on the basis of what he would call implicit or accepted necessary principles or categories. So the categories of pure reason and the, and the critique of pure reason of God are actually the conditions of possibility for the postulation of the freedom that you will need to, to, to be able to be an ethical human being so that you can be a moral agent. In order to be a moral agent, you need what the Asha'ira call the kasb. You need elbow room. And what the Maturidiya call al juz al ikhtiyari a, a kind of a, a choicey nugget or segment. So that Allah in his creation gives you this bit of elbow room, but it is enough room for the door to rotate, for the openness to happen. You need a fixity that has enough openness to make you do things as a moral agent. In Libya, in the Arab Spring, what are our pivots for this future Libya that is emerging now? What are the things, the principles, around which we must rotate as a nation? What are the principles that we cannot simply give up on, that we must be really rooted in so that we can be free? It cannot be anything goes, as Paul Feyerabend says in his book Against Method. It cannot be anything goes. It cannot be chaotic. It cannot be uh, chaotic in the bad sense. It is chaotic in the sense of being dependent on initial conditions. But it's not chaotic in the bad sense of chaotic. It cannot be anarchistic. There has to be some fixity. But what are these principles? Now, some people say that these principles are things that somebody can dictate to you, or that are ideologically based. So if you read Sayyid Qutb's Ma'arim fi tariq you will get them. This is what some of the ikhwan, not all the ikhwan, would say. Or if you read Kitab al-Tawheed of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, you'll get it. This is some of the Wahhabis or the Salafis would say, not all of them. But I believe that these principles are not to be found in this ideologically deterministic way, but are to be found in networks of the past, and networks of the present, and networks of the future. Networks of the past in having communion with and communication with your past. Imam Ghazali, if you take him seriously, is, yes, he is dead, but he is also living in, 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 in terms of ideas. As a matter of fact, we Muslims, and this is often forgotten, we believe in Haya Barzakhiya, a kind of a, 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 a virtual existence. People find that weird, but they don't find the internet or virtual reality weird, you know? But it's like virtual reality. It's just as you enter the internet, it is possible to enter into Alam al-Barzakh through mahabba, through love. Because as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, al-mar'u ma'a man ahab. The togetherness is through love. So if you love Imam Ghazali and you respect him, you do benefit from him. So you are, you, it is possible to live a life in communion with and networking with Fakhr al-Razi, Yarmawi, Ghazali, 
Baqillani, Nasafi, Taftazani. As a matter of fact, the whole tradition of madrasa and the isnad and the passing on of knowledge from one generation to another is simply an exercise in networking with the past. And you need to network with the present so that you have to visit scholars, you have to talk with scholars, and not just scholars, because sometimes you network with a guard who is, for example, there was this guard in a small village in Libya, and uh, I, I once, because I do have a degree in engineering, I ran a construction site, and I was so lonely I, I would have conversations with Chadi guard, you know, like have tea, and, and this Chadi guard who was illiterate, was a real master, a great sheikh, mashallah, you know, a real teacher who knew so many things. So what I'm trying to say is when I say networking with scholars, I don't mean just the professors. Sometimes they can be so arrogant and conceited, and, and uh, you need people of humility. So what I'm trying to say, you need to network with hum humanity at large, and not just your community. It's very easy to network with the people you agree with, but it, it's very important to have institutes like this that are established for, the, for having dialogue with people that you don't agree with. I mean, the whole point about ittifa, as you say, between madaniyat or hadarat, you know, it is to have some sort of a, a space, a forum, as the Romans would say, for people to come together and disagree in a civil way, in a way that is mutabaddin, in a way that is respectful of what the mashayikh would say in the madrasa, adab al bahth wal munadhar, the, the etiquette and the, and the adab of research and of discussion. This is a ilm, a science that used to be taught to students. You know, today in Libya, for example, I find sometimes it's very frustrating because some young people, the way they discuss with each other, they, they, they don't have the tools for civil discussion. So the discussion goes from low voice, beginning of disagreement, very quickly to disagreement, very quickly to shouting, and unfortunately, like happened yesterday or the day before, to shooting. Okay? So you, you need to have tools for settlement of disputes that is beyond physical power. And, and that is what scholarship is about. That is, that is what institutes like this are about. So you need this networking with the past, networking with the present, and networking with the future, in the sense that you need to be in touch with the future generations who will hold you responsible for their legacy. They will say, my father, why didn't you teach me about what my grandfather knew? How come you lost the tradition? How come you have no idea about who I am? You have a legacy that you must pass on, and you have a responsibility to live decently and morally, and to build something for a future generation. So when I ask the question in today's Libya, what does Libya today need? It needs these three conversations. We need to talk to Imam Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi. And as we speak today, today unfortunately I had to miss it, but there is a great conference in, uh, in Libya in a place called Ganfuda near Benghazi on Imam Muhammad bin Ali Sanusi. And in a way it's our country's way of having a conversation with the great Imam. You know? And we need to have conversations with Muhammad Ghafir al-Madani. I went and visited him a few days ago. I mean, every day I pass by and visit and read Fatiha in the Shari'i Sunni way, just in case some of our Salafi <laughs> brothers hear this, okay? By asking for Maghfirah uh, and Rahma for him. And um, we, we need to have a conversation with these scholars. We need to reread them. I am heavily rereading now uh, Imam uh, Sanusi, Sheikh Madani, our great scholars the book of Muhammad Bashir al-Mughirbi uh, on, on, um, on the Jami'at of al-Mukhtar, some of the politicians like uh, Mr. Saraj's book on the Hizb al-Muqtamar. These, these are, we need to have a conversation with the past. Some are living, like Sheikh Mustafa Saraj is living. We have to have a conversation about the past. But we also have to have a discussion now, and not to be exclusivists. I need to talk to the Ikhwani, to the Marxists, to the Salafi, to the atheists, to the, to the secularists, to the, we need to have this conversation. And we need to also look upon our children with responsibility. And, and, and this is very, very touching actually, to look at the future of these young people who have given so much of their lives, some gave their lives, these martyrs, these shuhada, some gave their limbs. You see these young people with no arm, no leg, 
you know. They gave part of themselves for a future. The nation is responsible for this. Every generation is responsible for this. This is a very big responsibility. So by having these three conversations, these networkings with the past, the present, and the future, perhaps we can begin to make sense of who we are, of what we want in this life, of what kind of a country do we want. We, generalities, we all know. We all want democracy, we want freedom, we want a beautiful future, we want prosperity. But how and what kind of prosperity? Is it supermarkets everywhere from which we can get all that we need? Is it a future of fulfilling of desires or shahawat? Is it a future that has the akhira as part of it? So that our utility function actually is more broad or broader than just this dunya. What kind of a future it is that we seek? You know, our women uh, in, in Libya, great teachers. They've taught us bravery. They, they were from day one in the revolution. They were part of this revolution. They made this revolution in many ways. What kind of a future do they have in this country? What, what does a Libyan woman want to be? You know? And this is a question that they need to ask and that the community needs to ask because Gaddafi also was said to have given freedom to women, but he used them as objects. Objects in, in a very uh, uh, based or debased manner. And now they are trying to find who they are, and they are articulating, and they are amazingly articulate. And there are Ikhwani women, and Salafi women, and Marxist women, and, and uh, Almani women, uh, uh, liberal women, and, and they, they're all trying to find who they are. And as they do this, they need to speak to Rabi al adawiyah from the past, and they need to speak to Turkish women, and they need to speak to, to uh, women in, in the UK, and in the States, and in Japan, and they need to speak to their daughters of what they want to give them as well. So it is through these complexities, this multiplexity, as, as you say, now I'm beginning to pronounce it properly. And to actually to use a te technological term, they have in telephony, telephony something which they call multiplexers. And these <laughs> multi multiplexers are like routers, but for, for uh, fiber, for example. We need to look at these multiplexers like Ibn Khaldun, you know? like these great, uh, great uh, uh, encyclopedic scholars of the past, because they were very wise people, be it uh, Shatibi or uh, Ibn Rushd, and not just Ibn Rushd the philosopher, but also Ibn Rushd the Faqih, who I believe was a greater philosopher than Ibn Rushd the philosopher in many ways, and many, many great scholars. And I am really happy to see Istanbul become once again a center and a great multiplexer for a big conversation that is happening with all philosophies, with all religions, with all ways of thinking, between social science, economics, political science, the fact that we are here in a place that, you know, has the love of Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi and the Mawlawi tradition, and, and that is so encompassing and tolerant that it is able to hear all voices and to have what my Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian critic called polyphony, a multiplicity of, of voices and not just monologues or one voice. It is through this that we shall have a carnival, to, as, as he would say, but a carnival of kainat, as Sheikh Nursi would say, that is in a great procession to its maker, to Allah Azza wa Jal, that is dunyawi, as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, living as if we are going to live forever, but also Ukhrawi, living as if we are going to die tomorrow. And so that we are optimistic, determined, and as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if the Day of Judgment comes and you are planting a, a tree, continue to plant. Because we don't plant just in this <laughs> world, but we plant mass, amazingly wide horizons in the hereafter. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفُرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِكَافَةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ And thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>